I would warn against doing anything in that space unless you have millions of dollars to put behind branding and marketing. You're wasting your time. Why has no one been filing patents? One issue I keep hearing back is that there, it wasn't until I saw our technology copied and released at the same time that I was like, oh, shit. How many paddle brands do you think there are? 20, 50? Try over a hundred. So then what makes Six Zero, a company based out of Australia, different? Maybe it's the carbon seam wrapped around the edge of the paddle. Maybe it's their unibody where the carbon face and the edge extends down the full length of the handle. Or maybe it's sourcing premium Japanese carbon. Prior to Six Zero, Dale was out in Tanzania helping solve water treatment issues, an endeavor he dedicated 10 years of his life to. After coming back to Australia and being introduced to pickleball by his mom, he quickly realized that the paddle he was using could be so much more than it was. And he was right. By leveraging his process engineering background and partnering up with former tennis pro Ludovica Shaki, they created Six Zero, one of the most popular and innovative paddle brands on the market today. Hey, what's going on everyone? Welcome to another episode of Building Pickleball where I interview company founders and players and really just sharing the different stories within the pickleball space. Um, my guest today is Dale Young. He is the co-founder along with Ludovica Sayaki of the company Six Zero. Thanks for joining me today, Dale. Thanks for having me, Brian. Did I pronounce Ludovica's name right? Yeah, I think so. Her last name's a little challenging. I think I don't even get it right half the time. I think it's Shaki. Shaki, <laughs> okay. Um, she couldn't join us today. There's connection issues um, with a platform that we're using, but uh, just, yeah, grateful to have Dale considering he's over in Queensland and right now it's like, what, like 10.40 a.m. on Monday? Yeah, yeah, it's Monday morning for us, so we're in working week. <laughs> Sweet. Um well, yeah, I know that uh, before this call, we we're talking a little bit about how you just got back from like a camping trip, right? Yeah, I just had five five nights off uh, school holidays here. Took the kids over to a place called Morton Island and we went for a camping, got off reception. It's been working seven days nonstop since November, so I uh, needed a little break. And uh, yeah, back on deck this week. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Is that something you do regularly? Is that like something that you think is helps you with Most like definitely. productivity? It's something I'm more conscious of in my as of as I've got older. Um, so I spent um, you know, ten years in my twenties uh, into thirties uh, working in uh, rural Africa, and um, think you'll ask a few questions on that later, but. Um, yeah, in, in, uh, at the, part of that process after five years, I burnt out, and um, so managing burnout is is important for um, for business for your own health, but also business health. So, yeah, I I, I think regular um, disconnects are really important um, when you're working with a sole focus and putting in the energy and effort required to to run a successful startup and business you you then need to also find time for yourself to have a break yeah totally and yeah how did you know or figure that out considering <laughs> six zero from based on what i heard is kind of like happened somewhat unintentional right you're asking like when do i know to to know to take a break or or well that just comes about from from driving yourself so hard that you burn out and you can't continue on with something or that you need to then go, you know, if you don't take health checks uh, and, and, a, and a, a good break, you find yourself that you, your productivity will drop and it might get to a point where you can't continue in a, in a role or a task. So you've got to continually refresh and those refresh periods might take longer or, and, and so forth. So, yeah, that. but if you if we go back to... To the origins of Six Zero itself, yeah, it was it was an unintentional business, you might say, in that I I got into pickleball around two years ago uh, through my mother. Yeah, you know, it was a sport played here in Australia by old people, and I was like, oh, I'm not getting into that. That's that's for oldies. But eventually, after my brother-in-law gave it a go, he said, Yeah, go and have a crack at this. So I went and had a game and was addicted and uh, loved the game straight away. I used to play a bit of junior tennis when I was younger, so I had sort of the the good technique or a, a technique enough to get me going. And um, yeah, 
And then sort of, uh, I'm a process engineer by background, so I had a look around at what people were playing with and like these paddles that look pretty low tech, what's behind them, what's in them, sort of deep dived into that. And then over the last 18 months, I've been playing around with paddle technology and just, and it was a side project, a, a fun passion project. Let's go and build the, the best paddle that we can and look at what the materials are and and what is being used now and how it can be improved. So um, yeah, over the last 18 months, been doing that and never intended to do a business or anything around that. And that's where Ludovica comes in that uh, she uh, runs a pickleball academy here on the sunny coast. Uh, she's uh, an ex-pro tennis player, uh, had a very successful junior career and uh, unfortunately had a serious injury, which took that out. Um, but yeah, she, she was... Uh, sort of uh, one of the people testing the paddles that I was um, designing and building. And then she was like, I want to do a business. Let's do a business together. And uh, I was pretty reluctant, but, um, you know, she's young and driven. And I I was like, okay, I'm happy to support this. Let's let's see where this goes. Um, and, um, yeah, it's sort of been a, a very fast, quick um journey over the last four or five months to where we are today yeah what what sparked the like change in the demand and just like the attention towards the six zero the spark you might say was was reviews from america on online the youtube channels through uh, your reviewers such as Pickleball Pirates, John Q, um, and Chris Olson, and um, Pickleball Will. Uh, reviewers like that um, got um, our name out there, gave us visibility in the market. And but yeah, the, the the foundation of that though was was the aim to build the best quality and best performance paddle that that we could. And um, you know, there's a there's literally a thousand pickleball companies out there now um majority are all copying each other um copying old tech and um not providing any new innovate innovative um aspects to the industry so i think you know when these thermoform paddles or hot mold paddles came out they perform differently they perform um in our view they give an advantage or a better performance than a the traditional um, paddle and you know when we talk traditional paddles not much to it it's literally um cutting out a shape and gluing on two faces and 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 slapping a handle on on it um not much to it so um yeah when you say these are high tech i would i would counter that they're not they're just an evolution of of what was uh, previous generation, and this is a new generation of paddles with improved um, manufacturing processes, improved materials, and um, and it results surprisingly in a better product. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know like the history or the like kind of the structure of some of these companies that were before y'all, and why something like this wasn't designed before, but. I feel like based on what I've heard, you know, six zero and what you've done and you and Ludovica is the thermoform tech, although that technology has been around outside of pickleball for, you know, obviously a long time, but you bringing this into pickleball, this was like two years ago. Yeah. I mean, I don't claim to, to introducing, um, hot mold or thermoform technology to the pickleball world. The hot mold technology was around, uh, when I first started investigating, uh, and researching pickleball, uh, manufacturing processes, brands like, um, uh, Rockney have a hot mold paddle from uh, a good 12 months ago. What we, what the innovative uh, aspects that we've introduced was that, um, you know, hot mold was not popular. It costs more. It takes longer to produce. Um, big companies at that time weren't um, interested in it because they could sell paddles, you know, cheaply with cheap manufacturing processes and and sell lots of paddles. So uh, that wasn't my focus. My focus was to build the best quality and high performance paddle I could. So that led me to hot mold technology. And I noted that a lot of paddles um, and high-end expensive paddles were cracking around the edges. Um, if you scrape your paddle, you know, reaching for a ball on the ground or whatnot, you'd often damage your paddle. Um, the new 
um, raw carbon paddles, the first gens at that time, your carbons and gauge, etc. Um, yeah, the people were paying a lot of money for those paddles, and then you could be one or two months in, and then you'd, you'd crack the edge or, or the handle would snap. So it was just looking at those basic failure points. Um, you know, same with Euler paddles, a lot of the handles had issues. And so it's just looking at how do we improve those paddles um, with simple engineering. And, you know, the main, the main um, innovative features that we've introduced are a unibody so that the, the face extends down through the handle, that solves the handle snapping issue, and then introducing a carbon seam that runs the full perimeter of the paddle. And that carbon seam um, adds strength, durability, but also improves um, the the power or pop of the paddle. So you know, and we don't claim that. Yeah, you know, at that time, other paddles were doing. Uh, other companies such as Selkirk have their research labs, and kudos to them for also moving the industry forward. Um, and other companies that are investing in R and D. Um, and you know, Selkirk Selkirk brought out their uh, edgeless um, paddles and. I think the main difference in performance is that, you know, when you wrap the edge, uh, the face material is wrapped around the edge um, versus ours is a seam or a welded type union. And that that allows for additional flex um, and and um, of the paddle. It's not super stiff. Um, that, that adds to the performance aspect of the paddle. So yeah, we use the highest quality materials we can. We source Toro Japanese carbon, which lasts a lot longer than um, other types of um, generic Chinese carbon. Um, yeah, we, we source the highest quality materials to, to, to make the highest quality paddle, as I said. Um, and then, you know, we're able to do it at a price point, which is competitive. Yeah, that, that's where we are at the moment. We continue to invest uh, in our R&D. We've got Four different R&D projects on the go at the moment, and totally looking to change up the the way that paddles are made in the in the near future. So yeah, we're very excited about that. So I, I'm currently doing um, deep manufacturing some paddles here in Australia um, by in our workshop and developing the next gen for for future for the future. Damn, that's awesome. Okay, there's like a ton of stuff that went into that that I got questions <laughs> about. Um, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, like Selkirk and that uh, design lab, definitely like totally agree on the kudos there. And something I didn't know, obviously, because I'm just I just don't have the background and the knowledge and a little ignorant towards it. But um, as far as like the paddles, and I talked to Carl Schmitz, and he's the one who told me about it, is like the throat, the open throat. I didn't know. For for me, I just assumed that that just was an area that allowed some like aerodynamics to a degree, but I didn't know that that actually provides like stability, which was like what Carl was talking about. So I thought that was very interesting. Is there, is that something that you guys, can you even talk about it? Is that something you guys are exploring at all? Open throat? It's not something that we're exploring at this point in time. I have looked at the open throat. I've played with the various open throat paddles. Yeah. I'd, I'd it's not something that I see a big advantage with. I see that it may, it likely um, adds some some elements that will mix up your flex patterns through the paddle. I'm not sure about the stability aspect. You know, they, they talk about it improving the hand speed. Again, yeah, it probably does to a degree. I think more of a, taking off the edge guard probably improves it a lot more than, than the throat. It's it's something that we may play around with in the future, but I think it also it impacts double handed backhands as well. You you can't necessarily get your hand the throat gets in the way of your second hand. So, and I think in our aspect we've got really you know because of the way that we've designed and built the paddle that throat area is still a, a provides uh, the sweet spot extends pretty well around the full perimeter of our paddle. So that area is useful in our, in my view, for actually those off center balls that you may hit. When you mentioned the flex, the difference between like having that edge guard, conventional edge guard, and that would kind of make it a little like stiff, but then with mm -hmm. the way that you guys are doing it, add some flex, does that contribute to the way the paddle plays when people are talking about how it holds? It's like, I've heard that in a review like on a six-year-old paddle, it holds a ball a little better. Yeah, I mean, again, that's probably not something that we intentionally 
you know, designed from the get go. It's, I mean, the way that I do my R and D and and build up paddles is a lot of iter iterative experimentation. I'll build ten different paddles of the same variant with different tweaks, and we will then decide which one we're moving forward with, and then and then we'll do an experiment on it to on another on another variable and and zone in on what works with that aspect so um, when you talk about grip and feel i think that's a lot more to do with the texture um, than necessarily the flex pattern but certainly the flex will add to that um, but yeah we was there's been a quite a lot of work done on the the you know the nano engineering or design of the texture itself we've experimented with numerous textures on the face um and yeah so you know to, to provide a illegal texture but also one that provides as we've seen from some of the reviews the you know we're up there with with the highest um spin rates on the market at the moment and that's because we put the work into developing that when it comes to pushing the boundaries well pushing the boundaries respectfully in terms of like innovation how do you find that process in regards to making sure that it falls within like the regulatory standards, but also like you want to, of course, try new things out. Maybe it's a texture, maybe it's, you know, that, that edge guard, things like that. I mean, the design scope is very clear from USA PA or USA um, pickleball guidelines. And you start with that design scope and, and that's your design basis. Um, we're not looking to push outside the boundaries of the existing design um, guidelines um, we'd be wasting our time I don't have the budget or resources to do that as well I mean when you talk about that throat idea I think that's certainly pushing the boundary push to the boundaries of what the USA guidelines are but um, yeah well done to Selkirk who, who were able to 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 introduce that innovation to the market yeah i think our main innovations will will and be around materials and how the paddles are manufactured and the processes behind that and and just looking to improve the the durability and quality of the paddles as i said moving forward with looking at different ranges of of materials and how you put them together um in a paddle you know it, it started uh, off like i said as a passion project now it's moving into you know a serious business when and we've we're reinvesting the the proceeds we make from those um, clients who are supporting us and a big thank you to everyone out there who has got behind six zero in the last uh three to four months so just overwhelming and, and astounding the support that we're getting from um, the pickleball community, particularly to our brothers in America, a big shout out. Um, you know, it just um, gives me tingles and the, the support that we're getting, and it just invigorates us, gives us energy to to, to um, reinvest those proceeds back into into R and D and to continue this fun journey of building, uh, you know, developing new products for the market and. Yeah, you know, hopefully they'll they'll be um, even better than what we've put out this this first round. No, it's super exciting, um, and no, I appreciate what you what you're doing. Coming from like a engineering background and just wanting to create something for yourself, and but now it's obviously shifted. But instead of just being like, I just want to like create a business in pickleball, but I don't have the background. You're coming back. You're coming into it with. Um, the, the yeah, credibility, yeah, the that's, a, that's a good point. It's a totally different angle that uh, we approach this business. It's from it certainly wasn't an intention to start a business and then work out how do we build a build a business around pickleball or what do we got to do to get a paddle and go on Alibaba and find a manufacturer and pick a paddle out of a pad catalog. I mean, that's what ninety percent or more of these companies are doing. I, I, I would warn against doing anything in that space because. If you're a, if you're a copycat, you, you're going to get lost in the sea of brands unless you have millions of dollars to put behind branding and marketing. You're wasting your time. So the the only way I see forward in this industry is if you're on the cutting edge, on the front leading edge of that innovation and technology development, and that's certainly something that we can add to the industry, and that's our strength, and we'll work to that. Um, but um, 
yeah, <laughs> I mean, nothing's for certain in uh, and other companies and and um, and I'm no doubt working on this space as well and will bring out their own innovations and I'm excited to see what they do and um, you know we'll, we'll we, we don't nothing's guaranteed that's for sure yeah no doubt I mean it's awesome it's great I I was never like a paddle groupie at, or just like a paddle collector I was just like I just want like one paddle that I want to play with but ever since like six zero um, Selkirk, Yola, Legacy, Help. There's people that are now playing with Vadix over in Austin by the Pan Am courts here, and I- I'm seeing them playing with them. I'm like, D- I just want to try it. Like, <laughs> but ever since the innovation, it makes you, it makes you want to try these different paddles. It definitely has that like excitement that you're talking about when you mentioned like Rockney and you mentioned mentioned like the manufacturing process. Like, I think one thing about that I've just been curious about is why has no one been filing patents? It's a very good question. Um, I think one issue I keep hearing back is that they're they're hard to defend, um, and that they can be expensive to to defend. I did make a mistake, I believe, in not patenting this edge technology. Um, and if we had done so, um, yeah, maybe we wouldn't uh, see. Yeah, the other brands that are out there, or the the new brand, the the <clears throat> this technology being copied in the in the next six months, which it no doubt will be. Um, but again, at that point, point my motivation was not business related. It was fun and to build a cool paddle. And you know, we're a small community here in Australia. We knew that we had a great paddle here and that people were enjoying it. Um, but you know, we didn't have the validation from um, pro players. We didn't have the validation from reviewers. So it wasn't even a, 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 a big, it wasn't even a thought, to be honest, at that point. It wasn't until I saw our technology copied and released at the same time that I was like, oh, shit, like, this is not cool. I'm not very happy about this. But at the same time, good luck to them. Um, we manufacture in China and um, some of that um, IP is um, is challenging to protect. You know, and then at the same time, I was like, well, look, I've, I've introduced one big innovation here. It's not, you know, it's a simple idea, but it, it turns out it, it's a very effective idea, it seems. It is what it is. We, we'll be more conscious of protecting our um, IP moving forward um, and we also have the budget and resources to protect that now. We do have a patent out over the shape of our paddle um, and we will be um, protecting that. And, um, you know, we've got a cease and desist out at the moment on another company that is using that design. And, um, you know, we spent uh, six months building up that that paddle design uh, with the shape. Um, and, you know, it's built on the... On, on the designs of of previous companies, uh, previous generations of paddles, but it is unique, and I think it provides um, from the testing and and playing that we've done, and the and like I said, all those iterations of various different forms and shapes. That was the one that came out and had the biggest sweet spot, but also provides fantastic, uh, you know, has that elongated um, shape for reach, so it works well. Patents are definitely tricky. I mean, like, it's hard to separate being like an idealistic person and being like, oh, well, I'll come out with this and hopefully, ideally, people won't copy it. Or if they do, like, you'll get credit or maybe like someone like Elon, you know, in the early days, he didn't want to patent stuff. He's like, no, this is great. This is going to create like competition, but it's also going to, it's like a rising tide lifts all ships, right? Like more people Mm -hmm. are going to be able to invest into it. Not saying this is the exact same scenario, but I do understand. And I'm glad that you guys are protecting more of uh, what you're putting your resources, especially time and effort into something that you mentioned was like manufacturing and also, did you mention manufacturing in Australia or just switching from China or um, no, I'm currently doing R&D in Australia, um, <clears throat> and that's that's with a 
and, and we may well shift manufacturing out of Asia in the near future, um, depending on the process that we develop for our next gen paddles. Um, How difficult is that? It's challenging. Decision. It's challenging because the, the re, um, it costs a lot of money to do anything in Australia, particularly within an inflationary environment. Cost of labour here is very high, and um, we're just not set up for that mass production. Um, and we and you'd have to develop all those systems and processes. So, you know, China is very well set up for that. The factory that we're manufacturing is the best factory. Uh, in this space, it has um, Taiwanese QA systems, and um, yeah, the quality that they're putting out, we're very comfortable with. Um, each, you know, something that people may not realise is that each run and each batch that we're producing, there is small um, in improvements that we add in based on the feedback and the and the response. Um, we see in the paddles in the market, you know, that might be adding a little bit extra foam to the handle length, or it might be adding some reinforcement in the uh, in the paddle. You know, so that, those those things are very well managed and, and undertaken in partnership with our manufacturing facility in China at this point. And uh, as long as we can um, protect that IP moving forward, we'll, we'll we'll be happy there. But having said that. Um, as we grow, we certainly are investigating, looking at some other manufacturing options. Vietnam's an option, and and even the USA, where our main market is, we'd be we'd be interested to look further there. We're looking at simplifying the manufacturing process and improving its you know quality um, aspects as well. So it's certainly something we're looking at, but it's also one that rely is part is, is probably three or four steps down the road in terms of our growth and, and maturity of where we are at this point in time. Yeah. 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 On Reddit, they talk about it quite a bit. They're just like, why isn't anyone manufacturing in the US? I mean, aside from probably cost, but yeah. Yeah, I think Engage has got a factory and um, Selkirk assembles um, paddles, and but also Selkirk I think also manufactures in China, their SLK range. Um but yeah, it, it comes down to cost, I guess, and and um, yeah, China's just very well set up for this in this point in time. If the um, yeah, I think one risk moving forward for everyone is is the relations between China and the rest of the world, and hopefully they stay um, stay stable with everybody. Yeah, definitely. Um, kind of switching gears. When I first spoke to Joey B from the Pickleball Exchange, he referred you over um he and something that he mentioned was the work that you and your wife had done prior to six zero was you, you guys spent like 10 years out in i don't know what to refer to it as but out in like uh africa from what i understand and doing charity work um can you go into that love to hear more about that story yeah sure so um this is going back into my youth <laughs> um when I uh, graduated from uni, I spent three years in an office um, I I doing engineering work and um, I just felt a little piece of me dying every day. Um, you know, I was excited to get a new job. I was working in a big CB in the cent center of Brisbane City in a big high-rise tower and sort of met all those aspirations of, of your parents when you're growing up, etc. cetera. But, um, yeah, my, I, it was it – was, it was challenging for me to, to live that lifestyle. Uh, my girlfriend at the time, she was finishing her PhD in, um, in, um, in science and she managed to pick up a job in malaria research and, um, and there was an opportunity to go move to uh, rural Tanzania in Africa. And so I said, yeah, let's do it. Um, let's go for it. Jump jump on this opportunity. We're young and um, let's build your career. I mean, I'm not really into mine. So we went over there and um, it was massive, massive change for us. A big um, you know, jaw-dropping experience. It's a massive roller coaster up and down those first few years. But, um, yeah, we were 10 hours inland from... Um, Dar es Salaam, the capital of Tanzania, in the middle of the bush um, in a rural community in an area with one of the highest malaria rates in the world and 
quite swampy um, region. And um, yeah, there we were, we were surrounded by mud huts and, and straw roofs. And um, after um, being there for around two years, I did a fair bit of travel during that time. I learned how to speak the language in a bush form. And um, they had a big cholera outbreak and my background is water, wastewater engineering. And uh, they set up, you know, people were dying like in, in large numbers. They set up like this emergency tent city um, and it was sort of out the back of our house and it was in our face. And, you know, up to that point, I was also trying to do some volunteer work or get a volunteer position with some of these NGOs or non-profit organisations. And... They weren't interested in my services um, and then I dug deeper and I found that all of these water sanitation programs, they weren't being run by engineers, they were just run by generalists and that they were similar to pickleball, copying the same stuff that had been done for the last 30 or 40 years. And I just dug super deep and got uh, did as much research as I could for six months um, on the uh, on the backside of this cholera outbreak, um, and then it, you know many things in parallel. At the same time, some of the rural villages my partner was working in heard that I was a water had a water background and asked if I could get involved and help. So, just sort of all came together, and I ended up starting this nonprofit organisation. I went back to my company that I originally worked for in Australia, and got some seed money, uh, I think it was $15,000 Australian and, uh, you know, put together a proposal and and we went from there and, um, you know, it was a long, hard slog from there on for the next five years swimming against the tide of of not only trying to provide services to rural Tanzanians but working in a highly bureaucratic environment, um, you know, it, it was it was it was very hard work, but I was young, I was passionate, and I was driven, and I went hard, and I worked seven days a week just for years, nonstop, going hard. But I loved it, and but that's where that burnout aspect comes in that we circle back to the start of our conversation, and that's why I'm I, I'm more conscious of monitor uh, of keeping on top of those sorts of things these days, but. Yeah, we ended up with 80 staff. We covered an area the size of Switzerland. We uh, It was all about trying to create small businesses for rural communities, not a handout mentality. It was, uh, it was a hand up mentality. Um, so people were paying for water from shallow dug hand, uh, shallow hand dug wells and they were paying um, for that water in their villages. And often the same guys who dig their open wells would dig their sanit um, latrine pit as well. And often they were like, you know, spitting distance from each other. Motivation was to do it once and to build the biggest latrine pit you can so you don't have to come back and do it again. But ultimately it becomes like a big tea bag in the water table and it's a tea bag of um, shit. And that leaches into your water and hence you get cholera outbreaks. So. Yeah, there was an important aspect. We had education teams going out, educating people around why they're getting sick, what they can do to improve their situation, and then offering products around that. So we would have a drilling team. So we had, I think we had six drilling teams going around the countryside drilling boreholes, but communities had to pay for um, materials. They had to provide labour and food and accommodation and some money aspect as well it was a subsidized program um, so yeah that, that we built um, businesses around sanitation we built uh, a water filter business and we what else uh, yeah I mentioned the education and oh yeah the, the, the one that got us some attention and uh, was we introduced a, a pump for life program where you pay uh, a community would pay a couple of dollars a month and if their pump broke, a technician would come in and fix their pump for them. And that was very successful when it was um, when we managed it, and um, that provides surety of water. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these pumps that are drilled in Africa are a top-down approach with from big organisations who are just trying to almost get rid of their money. They don't almost care how much it costs. They have a budget. 
and they've got to get rid of it. They'll go in, they do little engagement in the community, drill a borehole, whack a foreign pump on it, and job done. And the first time that pump breaks, there's no supply chain of spare parts, et cetera, and that pump then falls into, into disrepair and is not used. And you've got, you go through these real villages and you see tens of thousands of dollars that have been spent over the last 20, 30 years. And again, like I said, it's the same NGAs copying the same model, the same technology, same programs, wasting donor money on new boreholes and pumps, which break after a couple of months. That's, as you can imagine, kept me very busy for almost a decade and uh, to the point where I burnt out. And uh, we had 80 staff at the end. We uh, picked up, I think, the Nestle Global Innovation Fund Award or something like that. So, yeah, it was, it was a very rewarding journey like three years of flatlining and then it sort of took off whereas this um this pickleball journey is ridiculous it's like one month two months and it just it's already taken off so uh it's hard to it's hard to get my head around at this point wow that's an incredible story um that's funny that kind of brings me back to i think i went out there in 2015 i was out in tanzania i flew into dar salaam i think i left out of dar salaam i flew into like uh, Namibia or like Kenya, but I was spent just like two weeks out there and was out in the Serengeti, you know, was out with a Mas, I think it's called the Masa- Masai yeah. uh, tribe. And I wish more people could experience what it's like to be around people like that, um, to be around people who just have much, much less than us and the how they communicate how the relationships that they build with each other and also for your own sake of just being out there completely stripped of what you're used to right now and then going out there and being able to have a sense of empathy of what it's like to like you said like go to the bathroom with like a a hole in the ground or like what it's like to not be able to use water for food and like cleaning taking all those things for granted it puts in perspective your privileged life that we all live in australia or in america and that we take for granted and that you know i think you know coming back to australia now we have this society that has uh, very much an entitled you know they feel entitled that they're owed something and it'd be good if everyone took a flight to somewhere like that and spent a week or two out there like you said and just got a reality check of how the majority of people live in the world it's not in a fancy house with a fancy car and and you know pretty much guaranteed security yeah and and the people in real tanzania have a great sense of community and a great spirit and going through um yeah a lot more adversity than what we experience in terms of just base living but they're happier overall from from my experience yeah like every day is unpredictable like there's no guarantees right no guarantees of food no guarantees that you're gonna truly no guarantee you're really not gonna live yeah to, like the next day it it's true um the mortality rate is it, it is in your face uh and i was looking at some of the photos i sent through to you today and uh, unfortunately a number of people in those photos aren't with us today and it just sort of brought back memories yeah and it's simple things that people pass from. Not only would that trip be beneficial for like a reality check, but also it's just absolutely like beautiful out there. And like oh, the sounds. Stunning. stunning. Yeah. The sounds yeah. that you hear at night is somewhat terrifying, but at the same time, it's very <laughs> like, you're just very curious. You're like, how close is that sound that's actually like there? You hear like elephant, you hear hyenas, you hear like yeah. giraffes just craziness and you're like in the sky at night is just glittered yeah highly highly stars. recommend that everyone goes and does a, a camping safari and get a real experience of the of the bush yeah um i'll just bring up like one more thing within this and i'll change the subject but um something that you said that's so powerful is the hand up not a handout mentality. You see it everywhere, right? Like everyone's got this like myopic view of how to solve a problem or how to provide help that that hand up, not a handout mentality is so much more conducive to a long-term vision. Really admire that sentiment. Switching gears back to six zero, I could kind of talk about all that philosophical stuff for a very long time. You have a really popular paddle 
people are very eager to not only try it, but you know, people want to be a representative of the brand and help promote it. I think just one, when a product is product matches someone's needs and also can match their expectations, people want to talk about it. People want to brag about it. people want to, people feel more connected to it though. You're an Australian company, like pretty much halfway across the world. And, um, you have like the story that people admire. What do you look for in a sponsorship or ambassadors? Yeah, I mean, um, we've we've got a growing um, um, family of ambassadors, and we're happy to to take on more ambassadors. Um, I think that grassroots element is really uh, an effective way of creating reach of our brand. Um, and like you said, people who who reach out to us. Um, who have an interest in six zero and want to get involved, like being an ambassador is a great way of doing that. And, um, yeah, you get yourself a discounted paddle, you get uh, a discount code that you can give to your friends and clients and, and you can talk about the, the brand and, and spread the reach. I uh, just, it's, it's hard for us in Australia to compre- comprehend just how big America is and how populated America is and it's you know I look at where I, I look at where some of our ambassadors come from, and I say, oh, we've got five em, em, ambassadors in say Alabama, and then I'll go, oh, that that might be quite a, quite enough. And you go look at where they are, and you're like, oh, right, well, we 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 could put another fifty in Alabama and still not reach everyone. Like it's crazy. So. Um, yeah, look, we, we, we're a small company and um, we're growing fast and we're happy to to support ambassadors and, and those folks who want to get involved with us. Um, we do like ambassadors who do contribute to social media um, and, and look to, you know, it's a give, it, it's not a take situation, it's a give and take situation. So, you know, we're looking for, for people to help promote and, and give back, but also, you know, receive by getting our latest and greatest products as they come out at, at a good price as well. Pickleball just has this, like, again, I mentioned this like every episode, just the community aspect and it's awesome. Yeah. Um, it, it's amazing community, Pickleball community, and it's like one degree of separation, it seems like. You can pretty much reach out and get in contact with anybody and that's been another amazing aspect of, of this short journey thus far is how the conversations I've had and the people I've met and, you know, um, even if it is in um, difficult circumstances at some, in, in some points. But, you know, I've had a conversation with Ben Johns. I've met Riley Newman. I've chatted to, you know, um, the heads of USA Pickleball. Yeah, it, the, the, and just the, the best conversations and the best reward is the feedback from from your clients, so you, the consumer base, if they love the product and just seeing the the feedback, I don't know, it's kind of surprising to me. It's kind of like I don't not sure how to take it, but it's it's much better than getting negative reviews, right? <laughs> I mean, it's pretty awesome that we've got a paddle that people are enjoying, that people love to play with, and that you know it improves their game. And like I said. Uh, like our our motto is go next level. I generally feel this paddle can help you play at a at an improved level. That's what a lot of people are looking for. Uh, yeah, that's what they're looking for. Everyone's looking for an edge. Um, I'd say go and do do more drilling if you want that. But um, certainly um, our paddles um, uh, we believe are, are, are the best on the market. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I know. Hey, I know over in Austin, I the biggest <laughs> proponent. I think that's the word is uh, Joey Wild. Uh, he's like a up rising pro in the pickleball scene right now, and he's saw him repping the six zero because you just don't see it that often out here. Um, I don't. I don't really know why. I maybe they're just still waiting on their orders. I don't know, but <laughs> uh, it's awesome to see. Um, I know that you guys won the Queensland Business of the Year of twenty twenty two. What? What did that mean to y'all, you and Ludovica? Um, uh, that was um, that was actually Ludovica's um, Pickleball Academy. So she won that award. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, she puts a lot of effort and time into in, into her work and 
um, yeah, she was rewarded with that by, by winning that award. Yeah, so I, I think six zero was uh, was still in its infancy, so we weren't uh, involved in that award. Yeah. Okay, I was like, <laughs> damn, that's like super super quick. Uh, no, you got me on that one. No, that so yeah, that was um, Ludovica's uh, pickleball academy. So. And we can, uh, you know, Ludovica's a rising star of the Australian pickleball scene and, um, yeah, she's uh, certainly um, up there with the top females in Australia um, and, um, yeah, she'd love to go and play pro in America. I think she would shake it up over there. She's got a lot of power, really strong um, power game. But, um, yeah, she's trying to get a residency visa here. So um, until that's... Um, done she, she'll when that when that's done she'll uh hopefully get over there and and go join in a few uh pro tournaments yeah um well she's ever in austin definitely knows some pros out here that she can find some good games with yeah um, yeah 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 for sure i think um riley newman's got her eye on her for um for playing <laughs> uh, a few um guys came over for the australian open and and they um she grabbed some attention for sure yeah it um yeah I mean uh, people like Joey Wild we we really love guys like that who get behind our brand and Joey's an Australian expat in America and he's um he's uh, made it through to the main draw of a couple of um, recent pro tournaments so yeah kudos to to Joey shout out to Joey and um you know shout out to Hunter and Yates Johnson for um, using our paddles over the last few months they they were given a set of our paddles and. Uh, really enjoyed using them, so um, we really appreciate those guys for for um, for getting involved as well. Um, yeah, and we're we're excited. We'll be announcing some um, some new pro sponsorships in the next um, couple of weeks, hopefully. And we're we're excited to get behind uh, a small family of of pro players and and um, and you know taking out Ben Johns. Hell yeah. Everyone yeah. just wants to see that happen. It didn't matter like who it is. If like the number one player was JW Johnson, everyone exactly. always wants to see it's that person fall. Ben Johns. It's just, um, <laughs> you know, he, he's, uh, he's had a good run and he's, uh, he, he's uh, established himself as the goat already. And um, I'm sure all the pro players uh, would love to take him out. Yeah. Um, what advice would you have now that, you know, you've had an interesting journey with the work that you've done in the past and then also coming across creating a business in somewhat uh, unintentional manner, what would you say is the most important piece of advice you would have for someone who wants to create a business in pickleball? I, I'm not sure I'm the right person to ask advice to, but I, I reflect back on this short journey in pickleball. I reflect back on my time in Tanzania. I think the common threads are passion and hard work. and You've got to put in and patience, I guess, as well. I mean, this one hasn't necessarily been well. No, the patience aspect of this journey thus far is that I put in eighteen months of research and development. You know, I'm not. I didn't just go out and pick a paddle off a catalogue and launch a brand behind that with a marketing background. Yeah, you know, we put the work and time. If you put the work and time and think about what you're doing, add a new, you know, add on to what has been done before and do it better. And you put behind that your passion and you put behind that your hard work, time and patience, then generally you will be rewarded in life. That's my experience to date. Don't take shortcuts step by step and, um, and see where life takes you. Um, that, that's, that's my bites of wisdom, <laughs> reluctantly said. Hey. We'll take it. Uh, no, that's great. I mean, uh, you it's... never know what's around the corner, right? That's another life lesson. You don't know what around the corner that's going to bite you in the ass. And, um, you know, you, riding through those ups and downs is also a part of starting anything and managing your mental health through those ups and downs is also an important aspect in this modern life where everything is moving so fast. Everything is on your phone and you have to respond to it immediately or someone will get upset with you so you know you've got to manage your your your, your mental health around any um of those startup type businesses as well yeah and those are absolutely the beautiful things about starting a business or any 
uh, venture or journey is, you know, those ups and downs. It's because you're learning more about yourself. You're figuring exactly. out like, how do I uh, manage this obstacle? But the other thing you said about mental health is absolutely, absolutely true. And like text, text and emails. I can't even imagine like what it's like to be your business right now, like the flood of emails and when it comes to business, you can't really wait on those. I mean, if you're trying to run a successful business, then you can't wait on those. You can't like ignore those. At yeah. least for like me, if I have a friend text me, I can put it off a day or two. And if it's urgent, a different case. But in most cases, I would just be like, I'm just not going to answer yeah. this right now. I mean, a successful pickleball com- company has to be customer centric. And you know, we, that that's something we understand from the get go. And um, you know, we love to communicate and relate back with our customers, um, but it is challenging and we are, you know, we, we have to grow, we have to add resources as we grow. So that might be adding a customer services officer to answer 200 emails a day that we get and Johnny wants to know when his paddle's going to be delivered, you know. So Johnny, it, Johnny, your paddle's coming in a few weeks, all right? It's always Johnny, man. It's, it's always, it's always well, Karen, pestering everyone. Karen's always wanting to know when her paddle's arriving. So, Karen, it's coming in, uh, you know, a few weeks. If you, I send around, I'll send another email out today to everyone about their paddle orders. Um, but, uh, yeah, we've got a lot of stock arriving over May and June, um, and um, yeah, you know, I'm trying not to. Um, I'm trying to be conservative on delivery dates, so over promise. Always under promise and over deliver motto to live by. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Um, hiring for any roles. I mean, maybe someone listening was like, "Dude, I want to work for this company." We do have a need for social media management um, and, um, and and online marketing, but we're not actively looking for someone right now. But it's you know the, the best staff I had in Tanzania were those people who sought us out and came to us with a pitch. And I was like, how do you, okay, so how do I involve this person? And, and you know, if you're adding value and uh, it, it, it we, we will look to bring you on. Um, yeah. I mean, certainly it's challenge, It's one additional challenge being based in Australia, but, um, you know, we've got a fantastic um, business development manager in, uh, in Utah with Julie and um, she's also uh, managing distribution. So she's... She's uh, very efficient and, um, yeah, so it's just bringing on good people who, who can do roles that you can't facilitate yourself. Um, so I don't know. We, you, uh, you, you asked me that question again in three months' time where we are. <laughs> I think of half a dozen roles we could do right now. It's just like, but how do we afford the budget for those people um, is a challenge um, as well. We'll see uh, if AI can help out. Yeah, hopefully this chat GPT can answer um, emails. It would be fantastic. (laughs) We'll name uh, the chat robot Karen 2.0. Yeah, Karen 2.0. That would be great. (laughs) Um, Is there anything that uh, I haven't asked you about that you would like to talk about? No, I'm not sure. (laughs) Um, No, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about 6.0 and – Thank you for your time. I wish you all the best in your journey with your um, online um, uh, interviewing business. And uh, yeah, I would think Pickleball is a great place to 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 focus that as well. There's some very interesting people and characters and in the industry, and people are interested in those backstories for sure. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Where can people like find out more information? Like, was there social media? If you have, want to share an email, if people want to get in contact with you, if you want more emails <laughs> at this point, <laughs> um, I guess um, you can check out our website at six zero pickleball dot com. Uh, we're also on Instagram and Facebook. Um, we do have a large um, back order wait list at the moment. Um, orders are out to the end of May, but um, we do have a large number of um, paddles on their way and we should catch up on stock and inventory over the next month uh looking forward to having stock in hand and being able to get paddles out quickly to our um our supporters 
Um, again, just really appreciative of everyone who's following our journey and um, yeah, we're looking, you know, if you support us, what you're going to get is more innovation and new models released over the, um, certainly within the next three to six months, we've got our next um, products already lined up and um, yeah, looking forward to being um, an anchor or, an, or, a, or a big brand within the pickleball world. Hell yeah. Holding it down for Australia, man. <laughs> awesome. Well, really appreciate your time, Dale. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Brian. Awesome. Thank you.